And how fucking vulnerable is that? Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine what the conversation would have been if I had actually just said that, you know, instead of just going through the motions. Like, what if we actually just talked about it? But neither mm-hmm. was vulnerable enough to do that, I don't think. Because it's scary, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think for me, like, I, I don't know if it's part of me, like, this is such a generalization, but like my femininity, but I like when the person I'm with, like, will call me out on my bullshit. Mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of people don't, you know, I can kind of skate by for the most part. And it feels good when I have someone that's pushing me, but then there's that struggle of now I feel like I'm being pushed too much. Like I can't do anything right. It's not your hoodie. It's our hoodie. Have you ever lost your hoodie to a loved one? Maybe a girlfriend snagged your hoodie away from your, your closet in your bedroom and it's no longer yours. You're going to have to fight tooth and nail to get that back. Well, our guest today, Brett McGinn, the creator of an apparel brand called Love Fucking Sucks, is inviting you guys to enter into a merchandise giveaway. He's going to give away two of his shirts and one hoodie. And all you need to do is follow Love Fucking Sucks with three underscores on Instagram and tag a friend in his post today. So if you want to participate and win a free hoodie with uh, the Love Fucking Sucks logo on it, head on over to that Instagram account and enter the contest now. I am so excited to bring Brett McGinn and Emily Cox, a friend of his, onto the podcast this week to share their devotion to the process of love. He's a two, she's a seven, and we dig deep into both of their Enneagram types today as we begin to understand who they are as individuals, but who they are as friends. Brett McGinn realized that he had a talent for listening and understanding and sharing love advice when he was back in college. So. Instead of partying, he was building relationships with people who needed that love advice even back then. From making grand gestures and learning our love languages to fear of missing out and being put in the friend zone, today's episode is one of my favorites where we just play, have fun, understand masculine and feminine energy dynamics a little bit more through the lens of the Enneagram and love languages. Not to mention a little bit of attachment style tucked in there too. Mark your calendars for October 20th because Dr. Kristen Hick from the Center for Shared Insight is going to be our special guest for an open house in our private exclusive members only group coaching program. The I Believe group coaching program incorporates the Enneagram, becoming more self-aware through that tool, plus understanding your attachment style and how love languages all play together in order to help you find your ideal relationship, and then therefore being able to find an ideal partner to fit your ideal lifestyle. Head on over to our Instagram account and in the link in our bio, click join a group now and uh, we'll welcome you every Tuesday evening for our group call. If you're looking for more counseling and therapy support right now, head on over to the Center for Shared Insight, our sponsors for the podcast, because they offer a complimentary consultation where you can take the opportunity to be heard and understood as it comes to your therapeutic needs right now. We get all use a little extra support right now. And Dr. Kristen Hick at the Center for Shared Insight is accepting new clients today. Without further delay, let's get into today's episode with Brett McGinn and his friend, Emily Cox from Los Angeles, California. Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. I'm honored to be joined by two guests today. I can't wait to get to know them both a little bit better and then share their stories with you guys. We're going to first start with Brett McGinn. How are you today, brother? Good. How are you doing, Dave? I'm doing fantastic, man. And uh, when I first saw your Instagram handle and your clothing line, Love Fucking Sucks, I was kind of wondering to myself, like, will it even resonate with the people who listen to the podcast? And then we jumped on a phone call because uh, one of our core values here at the podcast is inclusion. And I wanted to include your story within the podcast community because, yes, you use the F-bomb in there, but there's Mm -hmm. really more to your story. So, Let's start right around the college era, <laughs> college age. Yeah. Uh, catch us up to speed. What's up with you, Brett? Yeah. So I always say, you know, when I was in college, 
most of my guy friends were getting drunk and trying to get laid. And I found myself getting drunk, very drunk on several occasions. But rather than trying to get laid, I was behind closed doors, talk, having heart to hearts with girls about relationships. And I've just always been someone that people feel like they can talk to and they can open up to. And, you know, I, I'm not judgmental. And I, as, as terrible as I am at navigating my own love life, I think I kind of give good advice to others. And that, to me, you know, like, love fucking sucks is, I love the irony of the name because I am the biggest hopeless romantic. And the truth is, love's the greatest feeling in the world. But when you're going through a breakup or you're going through a hard time, it can really fucking suck. And that's why I love love. Like, it's the only emotion that can make you ecstatic as fuck or depressed and, you know, in bed for days on end. Yeah, I can relate to that a lot. I've been at both levels. And uh, tell me a little bit more about what makes you a hopeless romantic. I I don't know. I just love rom-coms. I think in general, I tend to be a little more feminine than most guys. And I'm very sensitive and very emotional. And I just appreciate love so much that I have always wanted that love for me that you see in the fucking movies. You know, like I want the girl that I obsess over day in and day out. And yeah, I, you know, I've always been one to make the grand gesture in the past. And I am just, by definition, a hopeless romantic. Mm-hmm. You ever get any pushback on that? Like how romantic you are, how feminine you are? Are It doesn't sound like any of these things are something you want to change about yourself. Yeah, I think it's definitely caused issues in the past. Um, and mainly like when going through a breakup and to be honest I've made a lot of personal development in that area but there was like a a long phase in my life where if I was talking to a girl and things were going well whether we were dating or not um, if she ended it I always thought I could just do one grand gesture to win her back and now in my most recent breakup I, I I mean in terms of the girl that was most compatible with me and the best for me in my personal opinion that was the most recent breakup and it it was such a clean breakup and all she said was you know I just don't see this going any further than it already has and you know old Brett would have just fucking fired up a grand gesture and done anything I could to get her back but now I'm kind of like you know what if if you don't want to be with me then you're probably not the person that belongs with me Mm -hmm. yeah choose people who choose you that's a yeah, that's exactly. a good mantra to live by. Yeah. Yeah, so we were talking about the the college age where you were kind of like the friend zone, you know, like mm-hmm. behind closed doors giving advice. Give me paint me a picture of what those conversations were like. Um yeah, so usually it would be like I mean it's all case by case, but sometimes it would be like the girlfriend of one of my guy friends. And I think it always made the guys feel kind of weird because I would have such a personal relationship with their girlfriends. And, you know, I'm just a really personal person. So it kind of has always come naturally, I guess. But uh, I I remember one time in high school, actually, my parents were out of town and I threw a huge party. And uh, one of my good friends cheated on his girlfriend with this girl that I had a crush on. And they ended up getting married, him and the new girl. But I actually pulled him aside and said, like, I, I'm so against cheating. I've never cheated in my life, never would do it to anyone. And I was like, you know, that's really fucked up. Like, we're going to call your girlfriend right now and tell her that you cheated on her. <laughs> so we did. And, uh, you know, like I said, it all ended up working out because now he's married to the girl that he cheated on his high school girlfriend with. But, I, you know, in relationships, I just really appreciate honesty and open communication and that's kind of what I try to tell people to really focus on because you know shit happens and it's going to happen but if you're really willing to put in the work and you really trust one another and love each other in that way then you know as long as you're honest and open you can have a healthy relationship yeah I can I can get behind that and from the sounds of it like you're not alone like there are so many women out there that would be attracted to a guy who is the hopeless romantic and who does want to make a grand gesture. You know, that's why I'm such a huge fan of love languages that like Mm -hmm. acts of service and gifts 
okay, well, if that's your partner's love language, then they're going to be um, filled up with uh, the grand gesture and the big teddy bear that you drop off on the on the yeah. uh, on the front step. My uh, so my first girlfriend in high school, I. I learned how to sew. My friend's grandma taught me how to sew and I got her a heart shaped pillow and wrote, will you go out with me on it? And that was like, but that was when I really knew like, fuck, I, I'm not like most men. Like this is so extreme. And I remember I gave it to her at a football game and it was pouring down rain and all the rain was like smeared. I was like, God damn it. I just literally just spent like 10 hours learning how to sew by hand to make this pillow. And now it's getting rained on. And I think that was a, a nice little like metaphor of how my love life would be after, you know, like there's always a fucking rainstorm ahead. Mm -hmm. And if you guys are listening, that's Emily laughing. How do you guys know each other? And Emily, where, where are you at right now? Are you? <laughs> so right now I'm actually in Los Angeles um, in my sunroom. I'm like a half mile away from Brett. Actually, okay. <laughs> Surprising that we're not together right now. Um, but we know each other just through mutual friends. And then I moved to the East side and we became kind of inseparable. Mm -hmm. How did he talk you into coming on to a podcast that you knew nothing about? <laughs> That's just honestly the kind of person I am. <laughs> if it's Brett too, like if Brett needs a favor, sure, whatever. I'll talk about love with and, him for a little bit. And Emily's one of my like most open friends. She kind of like tells it how it is. So I knew, you know, I don't know if we're going to get into sexual activity on this, on this podcast, but if we do, I knew that she would be comfortable, you know, any topic that we might. We, we have interviewed a couple of sex therapists and we have another one, another one scheduled here pretty soon. Um, but I love just chatting with you guys because of that openness and because of the stories behind. And now, Brett, when we talked before, uh, we learned that you were the helper on the Enneagram. And mm -hmm. man, does your story, your origination story of why the clothing line started and the friend zone in college and high school, man, that just screams the helper on the Enneagram. Yeah. And in general, I do think I tend to have more female friends than male friends. Like last night, I had just had a little dinner party and it was like me six girls and one of their boyfriends and it was so normal you know like yeah. I, I can't think of any of my other friends that my guy friends that would just hang out with a bunch of girls as normally as I do mm -hmm. you would you would kind of think that you would have your pick right but is that the case uh, I mean not really thanks for reminding me Dave no it's not the case <laughs> um yeah, I, you know, I, I do think I do get friend zoned a lot. And it's just because I naturally, I just tend to like girls more than I like guys. Like they interest me more. There's usually a lot less ego. Um, and they can be real and vulnerable where a lot of guys feel like they have to act tough and act like they don't have feelings. And I, I just don't like dealing with that bullshit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can completely relate to that. It, it, your story almost parallels my own. And in, in high school, I had a lot more girlfriends than guy friends. Um, I think mm -hmm. I chose sports like track and cross country, cross country at that time, because they were co-ed. You know, yeah. like, I had a really hard time connecting with other guys at, in high school and college got a little bit better. But we did have that you just traditional bond of partying three nights a week. And yeah. numbing our emotions and not really talking about anything but golden. Okay, I went to college in the late '90s, so Golden Eye was the thing on <laughs> on <laughs> Super Nintendo or whatever it was. But Xbox, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, your story resonates a lot with me. Uh, even though you're the helper and I'm the challenger, um, men have a tendency to become like a nice guy, so that they can build better relationships with yeah. women and men. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's one reoccurring theme in my life. Like every time I go through a breakup, the girl always says like, you're such a good guy. You're going to meet someone that's right for you someday. No, and it's so I would, and that actually just happened recently. And I was talking to Emily about it and I'm like, I just, cause I get so fixated on one girl that it's like, I don't want you to tell me that I'm going to meet another girl. Like the truth is maybe I will, maybe I won't, but you know, I appreciate you saying I'm a nice guy, but there's no guarantee I'm going to meet someone else. And why this isn't about me 
you know, needing to find someone else. It's about you not wanting to be with me. Yeah. As simply as you can put it. Yeah. Um, she just didn't choose you. And I promise you, man, there will be another person that comes your way, no matter how long we have to wait. Are you breaking will... up with me, Dave? This sounds so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm sure there will be. And she's going to be great. Mm -hmm. Like I, I remember when I was young, I made a list of like all the things that my dream girl was going to be. And some of them were silly. Like she was going to live in a state with palm trees. But, you know, luckily I'm in LA, so that seems likely. But, uh, yeah, Awfully convenient like a, for... <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't even know. So the girl I was most recently with, um, really spiritual, into Buddhism, really into meditating, and just, like, so down to earth. Like, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't talk bad about anyone. And uh, I think... I think Emily and I talked about this recently, but I have never felt more comfortable with the girl than I did in that situation. Mm -hmm. And it was like, we never viewed. And then that kind of made me wonder, does this mean like there's no passion? Cause you know, I've been in relationships that overall, I think we're good where there was arguing. Yeah. Conflict. You know, like when something's you know? almost, it's, it's almost like too comfortable and too easy and too perfect and the mm -hmm. hopeless romantic in me was fucking loving it <laughs> i mean it was, it was the best six months of my 30 years for sure yeah i think uh i think we can kind of uh put that into the category of transformational relationship i was just mm -hmm. having this conversation with a previous guest of ours uh yesterday about what relationships come into our lives what people come into our lives to transform our lives yeah. And I actually want to, I want, want to bring Emily in um, for a lady's perspective on um, Brett's talking about being broken up with, and they always have this same phrase of like, you're such a good guy. You're such a nice guy. Now, from a girl's perspective, are those like nice guy qualities attractive long term? Ooh. Yeah, for sure. Long term. But I think that sometimes nice guys get get wrapped up with like pushovers and that's a mm. totally different mm. thing mm. Mm -hmm. you know so like I kind of just dated a pushover and that drove me crazy and I didn't tell him that he was gonna find someone nice <laughs> like I think that's like so <laughs> condescending too like you know yeah so but no I mean I think that, but ultimately, usually girls or like women are attracted to something that they can't have, which is similar to, you know, all of us. Um, so then the nice guy finishes left. Mm. Yeah. It's almost like too easy, right? Is that what you're saying, Emily? Like yeah. dating a pushover is like, where's your backbone? Yeah. Pretty yeah. Much. Are you going to stand up for me <laughs> or stand yeah. up to me? Exactly. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. I hate it when I know that I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And my boyfriend will just, my ex, because I'm not dating anyone now, but just like agree with me. And I'm like, this is, I'm being ridiculous right now. How are you agreeing with this? Yeah. I, I That's such, such a good point, Emily. And Brett, I don't know if that resonates with you based on um, n not having any conflict in the six months where um, one person yeah. can think of it as like a dream and the other person can be like, well, why are you just agreeing with me all the time? Yeah, I don't necessarily, like, I have opinion. I express them, but I am kind of, and, you know, in general, I think I am easygoing. And I can see why that would be, uh, you know, it would come off as being a pushover. I don't think in this last relationship that was necessarily the case, but I just think in my past I have, you know, maybe not, not put up enough of a fight about stupid shit because mm -hmm. what Emily's like you know sometimes some friction is good and mm -hmm. we have the kind of person that you know you ask them where they want to eat and it's always I don't care wherever you want to and I can see yeah. that I, I don't know <laughs> I'd have to chat to some of my previous lovers but I, I would hope to think I'm not that person but I'm pretty fucking laid back when it comes to like where are we going to eat mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because it's it's not so much 
like where you go to dinner. It's more of like who you go with and the quality time that you're spending um, while you're out yeah. to dinner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And that that term pushover is is sometimes associated with the helper personality type on the Enneagram. Um, Emily, did you happen to finish your test while I chat with Brett real quick? Yeah, so I'm definitely type seven enthusiast. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. This is going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> so Brett, uh, did that que- did that reference and reframe of pushover being associated with the helper resonate with you? Yeah, definitely. It totally makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. However, when you guys become, when the helper becomes a healthier version of themselves, their opinions matter more to them and they're able to set these healthier boundaries around that. Like, yes, of course, they're not going to necessarily mind where they go to dinner, mm-hmm. but they are going to mind at that time of like how their opinions are received. Yeah. And if their opinions are easily dismissed, that's when we have a problem with the helper. Yeah, definitely. Does that make sense? Um, I, and I, I do think like I've given so much of myself to others and sometimes I expect it back and it just never works out that way. And that can be detrimental to my mental health and happiness. Mm-hmm. Do you find yourself becoming resentful over time? Yeah, for sure. Um you know, with some people, but I mean, no one wants to feel like they're being taken advantage of. And luckily I think now the people in my life that, you know, they're there for a reason and I've kind of weeded out the people that I do feel like were taking advantage of me for a prolonged period of time, whether that's friends or people I was in a relationship with. Mm -hmm. Um, One thing I'd love to hear your thoughts on is I think in the past, I'm someone, I just always want everyone to be everywhere. And maybe that's, you know, affected my relationships because I, I want a big group of everyone and us all to hang out and have fun. Is that a, a normal characteristic of a helper? It can be for one of the subtypes, um, a subtype of being um, a social helper, uh, mm-hmm. like wanting to be the hostess with the mostess yeah. is a common term and a common uh, quality that uh, a social two has as an attribute. Mm-hmm. Like okay. your dinner party the other day, you, you want people to come together and, and enjoy themselves in a, in a group and experience yeah. the same thing that you're experiencing. Yeah, definitely. Emily, were you given the invitation to that dinner? Did you go? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. I would have freaked out if I wasn't. <laughs> His lasagna is, is amazing. His vegan lasagna is insane. Yep. What do you mean by you would have freaked out if you had missed it? Oh my God. It besties. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I, I know you're brand new to the, to the Enneagram. And the reason why I love that you're a seven is because you and your personality type invented FOMO. <laughs> you're, you're missing out. So. That. that is so accurate. She was the queen of FOMO. <laughs> oh my God. When I was in Michigan and they were all partying, ugh, it was, it was detrimental. It's tough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's funny because the two types can actually be confused for one another. Um, the reason being is that the helper wants to say yes to be loved and the f- an enthusiast on the Enneagram wants to say yes so they don't miss out. But the end result is the same. They show up to, they show up to events and parties and invitations that maybe they just know deep down that they shouldn't go to. <laughs> like this podcast. <laughs> But you didn't want to miss out. <laughs> exactly. I think that's so true because I, I just try to be as open-minded as possible. And sometimes I find myself in situations like, man, this was such a waste of my time. Yes. Like, I don't even care about this person. And here I am trying to please them. Like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Uh-huh. <laughs> How hard, Brett, is it to say no? It's so hard. Like, ask Emily. I am down for anything at any time. <laughs> And honestly, mm-hmm. I'm the same. We have the same problem. <laughs> but it also make, brings us a lot of fun. How so? Um, you know, just like spontaneous days of like, oh, let's just grab a few beers and go to the park and see what happens. Like, we don't need a plan. It's just we are together and something fun will happen. 
it, and you know, I do or, think so many people, like maybe they're in a relationship and they just get so comfortable doing the same old shit with the same old person. And we're not like that. We'll like, you know, we'll hang out with group A today or then we'll float over to group B tomorrow. But yeah, I, I agree. I think overall it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Saying yes to new experiences. Amen. <laughs> Even if it puts our own needs on the back burner. There was actually a time when I wanted to be um, like not a male escort, but a male escort where like there were these old rich ladies and they just wanted like someone young to hang out with. And I met with a guy and I was like, I would love to hang out with old rich ladies. Like, and I do that, but unfortunately he never placed me, but I was so excited to call Emily and be like, you're not going to believe what I'm going to do. Like, Well, and then where... I was the one who had to write the letter of recommendation. <laughs> Yeah, and I still didn't get played. So if there's any I, I can rich ladies listening, feel free to take me on a date and pay me 200 bucks. I, I can imagine, Emily, that that was a very, very glowing review of, of Brett in your oh recommendation. My God. Well, honestly, he wrote it himself and I signed and sent it. But it was very glowing. I, you'll have to read it someday. It's hilarious. Okay. So um, that's an interesting career uh, goal, Brett. Um, yeah. So you're basically just showing up on these dates to be arm candy? I never, I met with a guy who, for lack of a better term, I guess was supposed to be the pimp. And uh, he, you know, it sounded like it was, it was going to happen. And he had like this underground network of like all these wealthy, divorced, sad women in L.A., and I think like I'm so easy to talk to that honestly it would have been a great fit and a lot of them just love talking about themselves and they just want someone to listen and you know honestly I noticed that a lot in people going through breakups too and that's why I love talking to people about them because sometimes like when you're going through a breakup you think illogically even if you know what logically makes sense you just need to hear someone else say it because you are so caught up in the breakup and the emotion that you cannot think logically for the life of you mm -hmm. there's some serious cognitive dissonance going on in the first few weeks after a breakup i've been there before how about yourself emily mm -hmm. oh yeah just completely irrational it's the best time to lose some weight though that's what i always say i'm not looking for my forever partner <laughs> i'm looking for somebody who can inspire my next weight loss journey yeah i just need to I... jump start that next weight loss journey so i I can't tell you how many times I've told Emily, like, fuck, I'm so depressed, but not to lose 25 pounds, like my last breakup. And yeah. that's what I'm striving for. That's really the goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, definitely uh, hard to stay motivated to do anything good for yourself in the, in the week or two after a breakup, maybe even a month, depending on how long and how deep, deeply you are connected with the person. I... I am normally very driven and my, so the last girl was, I guess, kind of a fling. We were never officially dating, but my girlfriend prior to that, when we broke up, I could not get motivated for the life of me. Like I literally did not give a fuck about anything for so long. And it just felt like I was so not myself because like I said, I normally am driven and that was so hard, you know, just, uh, I just, when I'm in it, I'm in it. And it's just so hard for me to find excitement in anything. And even, I know Emily can tell when I'm in those moods, because she'll just be like, what are you thinking, Brett? And I can tell I'm just like <laughs> staring off, like having the deepest thoughts, just going like so far back in a relationship. And like, why did this happen? Why did I do this? Why can't I do that? And it's something I struggle with. But uh, like I said, I think, you know, the last breakup was the most mature and it was the person that was probably the most compatible for me. So making a little progress and that's really all we can ask for. Sure. Um, it, you said it was about six months long and you were never official. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. That's so exactly right. when and how did those conversations come up about exclusivity or defining the relationship if ever at all? Yeah, no, they did. Um, I, I think it was very obvious I was hoping to make her my girlfriend, not, not in a forceful way, but, you know, I was hoping that's where it was leading to. And 
she was always honest with me. She uh, she had gotten out of a three year relationship about five or six months prior, and it you know it was a hard one for her. And she thought she was going to spend the rest of her life with this guy. And uh, you know she, she would just say, "I'm not ready for a boyfriend yet." And then when we ultimately had the talk of you know it's been like four or five months, like what's up? Um, she said she was very focused on the now and you know, I was part of her now and she just couldn't commit to anything in the future. And I struggled with that because I obviously wanted to date her, but she was also so amazing that I was like, I'm not going to fuck this up just, you know, three months prematurely just because she won't call. Like, even if I was her boyfriend, nothing would have changed. Like we were, we were inseparable and we were talking all the time and having just like such great deep conversations about the meaning of life and all that fun stuff. So it it kind of sounds like it felt like really good friends, best friends with a uh, romantic intimacy involved. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's one way to put it. And I do think sometimes I'm almost so open, you know, like I know when you're, you're dating someone, you're very open, but I think in some ways that can get you friend zone too. Right. Like mystery, like every, mm -hmm. no one ever has to think what I'm thinking. Cause I fucking say it. And I can see why that could put a damper on a relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mystery is a very key component to building attraction, especially early on. Emily, mm -hmm. have you experienced anything like that? Yeah, but it's so annoying because I feel like when, I don't know, there's, you hear those stories of like, oh, we didn't, ha we didn't play games. There was no mystery. We just fell for each other. And that sounds so great, but so not a situation I've ever really encountered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, is that a myth? <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, definitely mystery helps and it's hard to remind myself to stay mysterious, I feel like in the beginning, because you do just want to like, go for it. But and that's something that yeah. I, I kind of struggle with that. Like, everyone says being vulnerable is so good and so attractive, but if you're too vulnerable, I think it can be detrimental to a relationship. And I think that's what I have found myself doing in the past, like being too open and, mm -hmm. you know, lacking any mystery whatsoever. Sure. Yeah. Let me ask you guys a, a pointed question to this, this topic right now is does vulnerability have to include full transparency? Mm. Oh, fuck man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. no, because I think there is some stuff that's so personal that maybe no matter how much you care and love about someone, you don't have to share it and you shouldn't feel that you have to. Mm -hmm. I agree. And if, if, you know, the other person takes offense to that, then that's just their ego gain in the way of the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you well think, said. Dave? <laughs> yeah, what's oh. your answer? We've talked about your Enneagram types, the helper and the enthusiast, and I'm the challenger on the, pers on the Enneagram. So my greatest fear is being hurt through my vulnerability. So I have to grow through vulnerability. But that doesn't mean that I, can, that I remove all mystery by being 100% transparent. Uh, that's not at all what it means to me. But I think that vulnerability is putting aside, like Brett talked about, my ego, but more importantly, my shame. You know, I can use an example from my life this year of losing my job in March. Okay, well, I didn't carry any shame from that event because I couldn't do anything about it to prevent it. You know, it wasn't my performance. It wasn't my behavior at work. It was simply just a, a out of my control circumstance that I still can't even control. But when they come back to me and they say, Dave, we want you to come back and, and work at the gym again. The answer is no now. <laughs> Sorry, that. I've... I've moved on to, to better opportunities in my own life because I've created it. And that story for me is very vulnerable, but I didn't have to share fully transparently of like, oh, I lost this much per week or like they treated me like this when I walked out the door or I never heard from them for three months. And then three and a half months later, they're like, hey, we're ready to open the gym. Are you coming back? Oh, no, no, no. You got to woo me a little bit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> of course I felt hurt when the gym closed but that was out of their control as well so i didn't hold it against them and i didn't take it personally but but you know what you didn't continue the relationship when the gym was closed and 
when it comes down to it, we're just people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that would be my framing around vulnerability without a whole lot of transparency. Um, but still, when you're meeting somebody new and you want to build the, the mystery uh, or just have mystery or just have excitement to see them again, well, vulnerability can really deepen the connection between two people, first, second mm -hmm. month in, six months in, a, a year in. I think it's really important. And with the last girl, I definitely felt like I could talk about anything and just having that you know I I mean I have so many great friends but when it's a romantic partner it just takes it to a different level and I I guess that's that's so important to me like whoever I end up with I'm going to be vulnerable as fuck and it's going to be great so it sounds like you gave all of yourself to a relationship that didn't have any agreements or boundaries around exclusivity or commitment so do you feel like giving so much yourself, giving away your, your king-like behaviors to somebody who's only bringing in maybe like a court jester type level of commitment, not to like, Ooh. not to put labels on it in a degrading way, but like just <laughs> in the analogy, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, because I guess, I guess from her perspective, it's like, what is there to look forward to? Like, I already have all of this guy and, you know, I don't know. It, like being too accessible too early on could be a turnoff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Being too available too early on. Totally get that. Yeah. But that I do think, attraction. but then, you know, you can play devil's advocate and say, whenever I do meet the right one, because that's all I know how to be. And I, I just like there's no bullshit with me like I mm -hmm. say how I feel and you know sometimes my emotions run haywire and you know I, I I would probably benefit from controlling them but I would much rather be honest with the people that I love and you know luckily all the people all, all the people that are close to me are able to deal with me and they know you know I'm a little different but I think they also respect that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Emily, what are your thoughts? <laughs> I, lo I love how different he is. He's like, I've never met anyone like him. And there's just times when I'm alone and thinking about certain things that he does and I can just bust out laughing. Like, he's so different and he's also so sensitive and I love it. And he's always willing to express his sensitivity too. And, um, and it, even, it makes me tap into my sensitive side more I feel like so I love him <laughs> <laughs> yeah I love you too oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah some good synergy there guys have you ever dated no us too we made out one time Friend when we zone. were drunk after the Heim concert <laughs> we did make See, out at the Heim concert <laughs> really drunk <laughs> mm -hmm. so you made out once Fun. and then Brett said he got friend zoned what's up with that Emily well, honestly, I've been very upfront from the start. He didn't, he wasn't a fan of Felicia when, when we, like now he is apparently, but like, that's just a deal breaker for me. Not happening. So yeah. that was So easy. basically I, my tongue is connected to the bottom of my mouth and I <laughs> thought that I couldn't perform cunning lingus, but uh, okay. ends up in my last relationship. I found out that I, I can and uh, you know, I'm probably much better at using my tongue than other parts of my body, quite honestly. So, um, I, you know, in terms of sexual advancement, that a lot came from that because I've been so, I've just felt so insecure about my fucked up tongue that, you know, basically cemented to the bottom of my mouth. And here we are, you know, now we're, we're performing fellatio on women. And <laughs> It's great. I'm a big fan. I can't believe it took me this long to get into it. I'm proud of you for taking that leap, Brett. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely sounds like that's one of Emily's requests uh, for sexual, <laughs> sexual activity and one of her preferences. So, <laughs> so Emily, I, uh, when, do you, when do you ask that question of the guys you're just meeting or when you're dating, like, hey, this is my deal breaker. Are you, are you down for it? <laughs> I've never encountered this. 
where someone's not been into it. <laughs> and um, Brett, even before Brett and I were like really close, I knew quite a bit about his, um, his sex life. And he just, he made it sound like, you know, I don't know, it's not a priority. So I, there wasn't any like asking and he would show us his tongue. And it was like a constant point of arguments um, is his tongue. So I didn't even have to ask. <laughs> sure. What kind of arguments? Like you felt like he could still perform that yes. act even with his tongue? Okay. Yes. Bullshit. <laughs> it was right all along. I think Love the being right. just try. Just try. And, you know, good things Amen. come from it. Definitely a new topic on the podcast that we've never gone oh. gone towards, but hey, let's let's keep rocking and rolling, Emily. Now that you know that, <laughs> does it does it change your mind at all? Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's definitely not completely off the table now, like it was before. But you know, we're best friends. Mm -hmm. I know. I know. When I told Emily I was going through a breakup, she's like. Brett, you eat vagina now. Like you can, like you're, you know, you're a viable option for so many women that you weren't before. Like this is yeah, great. You're gonna yeah. meet someone new. And I was like, wow, she's right. Like I do eat vagina. I just remember I like had that self reflection. I'm like, I eat vagina. Like I can do this. I'm gonna get through this. <laughs> you're much more marketable now as a, as a, as a vagina an eater, eligible yeah. bachelor. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Totally Seriously, great. now I can actually like link him up with other people. Before it's like, no, I'm not gonna do that to my friend. <laughs> oh, so you were hesitant to introduce him and set him up with your friends because you knew that he didn't perform that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they all have the same needs as her, you know, it, it makes sense. And What's great too is when I, I went all in, like once I started eating vagina, I bought this book called She Comes First. I don't know if you've heard of it. And I, like, I appreciate women so much that I, honestly, it was just my insecurity. Like if I had known I could pleasure them like that, I would have all along. And I just like studied the female body and I was just like so excited every time. And yeah, I love it. It's, it's very fun. It never mm -hmm. feels like a chore to me. Mm -mm. Oh, and I, I definitely enjoy this topic because uh, coming back to the fact that you say you're more feminine than other men, and you just said that um, you're studying the female body and you're exploring. Well, mm -hmm. exploring your partner's body is a great way to settle into your masculine, especially in an intimate situation. So I say, I say go for it, man. Thank you. Keep exploring that. Yeah, I, you know, hopefully someone else wants to be explored soon. <laughs> now that you mentioned that, <laughs> your body is a wonderland. Well done, Emily. And I'm glad that you brought that up, Brett, because when we were talking a couple of weeks ago, um, you said that everyone wants to heal quickly. How much time is enough time between relationships for you? It's, it's so case by case. Um, I... I'm someone I need like a couple months. And if I do try to date prematurely, like I remember when I was going through a breakup and I went on a date two weeks later and I fucking made a reference to my current girlfriend and the girl was like, current girlfriend. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm going through a breakup. Like it, it, I'm just so not used to saying ex-girlfriend. And she's like, why are you on a date? And it, I just become like such an emotional wreck. I'm like, why am I on a date? Like, I don't even eat vagina because at the time I don't. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, I definitely need a couple months. And I, I am someone like I know, to me, it's like building a house without a foundation, right? Like so many people, they look at someone else to find their self-worth and their, their feeling of being loved. And they don't know that they have it within them. That when that relationship, the foundation falls apart and the house crumbles, and they're quickly looking to attach to something else so they can, you know, feel loved again and feel worthy and socially acceptable, if you will. And I find myself doing the same thing. But for me, there's just like such an, it, it, there's like this air of sadness when I do it. And I'm like, I know I shouldn't be doing this and it's not making me feel good about myself. And even if I have like one great date, I'm just not 
emotionally available and it it, it shows because I'm too I'm too outspoken and vulnerable. Yeah, because you're wearing your heart on your sleeve and you're just pouring your feelings out there at all times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Emily, how about you? How long is uh, long enough after a relationship ends before you start dating again? It's always so different. Um, like one, one guy, it only took me like, a, I don't even know, a month. And we had dated for a long time. Another one, we broke up five years ago and I'm still messed up sometimes. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I just, it was so tumultuous and I feel like there wasn't really full closure. So mm -hmm. that one still lingers with me. Others, you know, yeah, it's, it's so case by case. And yeah, I think the worst thing is honestly not giving yourself enough time and not just allowing yourself to feel that hurt and going out. Like I literally started crying in the middle of hooking up with someone because of that I put myself in that situation. It was like the most embarrassing, devastating, sad thing to happen. So it's like, I just learned you got to be patient and be okay with being by yourself. And now I worry I'm too comfortable being by myself. I'm like, oh my God, am I ever going to mm -hmm. want to go date? Mm -hmm. Yeah, ultra independence is a trauma response for sure. I, I was just watching Forgetting Sarah Marshall the other day and he starts crying during a hookup too. And um, yeah. uh, not, to, not to minimize your experience at all, but <laughs> tell, me, tell me more about the five years later, it still comes up. What closure are you seeking still? I don't know. I think that we both kind of messed each other up. Um, and it didn't it didn't really fully end ever. Um, and, and we haven't fully talked about it. And I don't think that he would be willing to become vulnerable at all mm. um, for that. So I'll hear from him here and there. And it's like, it was so up and down that sometimes I miss that craziness and I even had a dream the other night about it. And it's like, how? But then the most recent guy I couldn't think twice about. And, it, and I loved him just as much. It just wasn't as, I don't know, mm -hmm. I, guess, I guess impactful or something. I don't know. Yeah, so you described the relationship as like up and down. Was there mm -hmm. a lot of push and pull, uh, leave each other and then come to back together? behavior for sure for sure and we both had like abandonment issues as children so we both kind of abandoned each other in a way and mm -hmm. it was just messed up on both accounts like we mm -hmm. were both loved so deeply and then also just kind of hurt each other so deeply and mm -hmm. like I would never that was when I was like 25 or something so I just couldn't imagine behaving that way now or even putting up with it but both of us were like in it mm -hmm. and yeah yeah I see that I see that your uh, your story has so much value and I, I think that some listeners are gonna are uh, gonna kind of connect and resonate with that a lot I know that I have in the past oh uh, it's it's known as trauma bonding so where you, either an avoidant or an anxious attached get together and there's a ton of push and pull or two avoidants get together and all they want to do is leave each other, but then they don't necessarily want to um, miss out on the opportunity of having intimacy. So they come back together. Yeah. Does that resonate? Absolutely. Insanely. And it was even like abusive and I would find, I would just try to read these articles on like why you have to leave an abusive relationship, but it's, crazy now seeing some of my other friends get into situations like this and I'm like had I not gone through this I would be judging you like crazy right now for being with this guy mm -hmm. but you are in mm -hmm. a very classic relationship where people just become totally codependent on each other and it's so unhealthy but when you're in it it's you can rationalize it mm -hmm. somehow yeah, I hear that all the time from from the members of our private group or from the people that I coach. I hear that all the time. Uh, listeners reach out, 
And one of the purpose, one of the purposes behind the podcast is to provide resources for our audience to seek out professionals. You know, when when they're ready to leave that relationship, uh, we have a lot of resources that we can hand out in a lot of different areas across the country. So if you are feeling like that's a relationship you've been in before or um, are in currently, don't hesitate to reach out for some help because um, that's what the podcast is here for. So thank you very much, Emily, for sharing. I, I know that you're, I know your experience is going to help others for sure. Awesome. Brett, did you have something to contribute? I, I felt like you were leaning in a little bit there. Um, I, it was interesting how she said, like, from my perspective, you know, maybe the relationship was the one that affected her the most. And in some ways, just kind of going back to like, you know, does there need, does there need to be some kind of conflict for there to be genuine passion? Um, I don't know. I, I was just kind of reflecting on mm -hmm. that while you guys were talking about it. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic question. And I think that uh, we have enough time to talk about that. And um, when people are walking on eggshells around each other and avoiding conflict, oh, it does nothing but erode trust between the two people, whether that's subconscious or consciously. Mm -hmm. And why I say conflict breeds connection is, yes, that's definitely the way that my personality type approaches things. Okay, I'm not going to avoid this conflict. Um, but we can do it in a way that's healthy. And there are four different conflict styles, much like there's attachment styles, much like there's personality types. There's four conflict styles. Mm -hmm. And an avoidant conflict style paired with an avoidant attachment style paired with somebody with a trauma experience, well, that's, that's definitely um, going to lead towards the experiences that we're talking about today, mm -hmm. you know? people walking on eggshells, getting into codependent relationships where uh, they feel the other person's feelings, not like an empath, but more so like a codependent, like their happiness makes me determine my happiness. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a really hard place to be. Um, but when we, when we do have healthy conflict where we're asserting our boundaries, not, not aggressively, because there's a big difference there. When we're asserting our boundaries in a healthy way, it can really deepen the intimacy between two people that are involved, whether they're romantic or family or uh, friends or roommates or coworkers. Yeah, totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. Does that resonate, Emily? Yeah. You guys are probably wondering, how do I have that conversation when I'm avoiding conflict? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I I hope to never get in that kind of relationship again, to be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, like you said, we can't see it coming and we don't necessarily know that we're in it when we're in it. But there's ways that we can mm -hmm. assertively, assertively set our boundaries in a healthy way that can either prove to ourselves that we're not going to allow a codependent relationship and a resource that I point people to is nonviolent communication. Mm -hmm. Hey, I've noticed some codependency coming up for me. Is that something that you're also experiencing? Do you have time or a willingness to sit down and actually explore that with me later this week or later today or right now? Wow. And how fucking vulnerable is that? Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine what the conversation would have been if I had actually just said that, you know, instead of just going through the motions. Like, what if we actually just talked about it? But neither mm -hmm. was vulnerable enough to do that, I don't think. Because it's scary, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Sure. I, I think for me, like, I, I don't know if it's part of me, like, this is such a generalization, but, like, my femininity, but... I like when the person I'm with like will call me out on my bullshit. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people don't, you know, I can kind of skate by for the most part and it feels good when I have someone that's pushing me, but then there's that struggle of now I feel like I'm being pushed too much. Like I can't do anything right. And mm -hmm. I've, I've struggled with that in past relationships and mm -hmm. 
yeah, I think it all comes back to open communication. Like, and I would just, I would get aggressively angry and, you know, I'd either keep it bottled up for too long and then just snap or I, I didn't even agree with what I was saying half the time and I knew it, but my ego wouldn't let me accept it. And I, you know, I was just fighting for the sake of fighting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. That's awesome. Um, every coach needs a coach, right? So I, I have my coach and I talk about Connor from man talks all the time and he guides us a bunch of men in the group, a lot like you and me, Brett, who are mm-hmm. challenged with, um, digging into our masculine or getting back in touch with our masculine and, and yet still honoring the feminine and in all of us. And a resolution to conflict is just label the thing. Mm -hmm. Hey, I feel codependent right now. I would like to explore where that's coming from. Or um, I felt after our first date that my avoidant attachment style was either activated or trying to keep me safe and far away from the intimacy that I actually felt on our first date. Yeah. Wow. I said that wow. the other day. Mm-hmm. And it, of course, yeah. <laughs> like, are you I, single now or what's up? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had no intention of actually saying it that way, or I had no intention of like, um, seeing into the future about how that would, um, how that would actually play out because it's, it's better, like Emily said, better to say it early on than spend five years or three years or 10 years with somebody and you never address the issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the only experience that I'm experiencing right now is either um, my avoidant attachment saying intimacy is scary run. Or now that I'm aware of that, my, my mind body connection is actually alerting me to something like that. Now I can share it with somebody I'm interested in becoming a partner with and possibly hopefully deepen the intimate connection and relationship. Yeah. I, that's something I've noticed. It, I kind of touched on it, but moving forward in any relationship, I just want to be honest. And as issues arise, I want to address them because I do, do tend to avoid conflict. It's just because, you know, conflict kind of sucks usually. Um, but the, it's just so beneficial just to work through the stuff. And, you know, you just always got to be honest and open. Mm hmm. Is avoiding temporary pain worth the long-term struggle? Fuck no, it never is. But, yeah. you know, for whatever reason, it comes naturally to avoid the pain. And, you know, next thing you know, you feel like you're underwater and you can't get back up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we tend to move faster away from pain than we do towards pleasure. Mm-hmm. 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 All right, Emily, yeah. close us out. What what stood out at you today or what did we not talk about that you wanted to leave us with today? Oh, God, what kind of pressure is that? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Don't miss um, out on your chance here, Emily. Oh, my God. <laughs> what stood out to me today? Um, I'm just really proud of the way that Brett has evolved. And um, I'm also just happy that you were able to have make me get vulnerable. I really had no idea what to expect. So we talked about placeio and vulnerability and you know, new like new ways of communicating. I think this was all awesome. I, <laughs> that's what I'm Thank leaving. You, Emily. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. And Brett, what would you like to close us out with, man? What did we what did we not get to today? What did we briefly touch on that you want to expand on? I, I, I like not to piggyback off Emily, but I'm pretty pleased with everything we talked about. And, you know, it's just nice. Like we all go through relationship issues and I always enjoy sharing my experiences with people. And it's so interesting. You know, I think you're a, she's a seven, you're a one and I'm a two. But like, <laughs> okay, you're an eight. Sorry. Yeah. At the end of the day, we all, you know, we seek love and affection and while we have different methods of trying to get it, we're really struggling with the same issues. And that's why I think the Enneagram is so, you know, I, I'm super spiritual and I believe all the shit that I read about astrology and this kind of stuff. And the girl I was talking to is really into Buddhism and she always sent me like, you're this type of person, I'm this type of person. And it always checks out. 
So, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's just cool to have another tool to realize why the fuck I am the way I am. And that we're not necessarily bound by the typing system because it's super fluid. Mm-hmm. And I'm not too familiar with astrology, but I read this meme the other day and it said, hey, all the, all the, all the girls out there who are big into astrology, what planet do I blame the current situation on? And the <laughs> comment, be- and the comment yeah. below was Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so very much for joining me today, guys. Um, we'll have to catch up and, and do some more work together in the future. And I know that, um, Brett, you and I are collaborating on a merchandise giveaway. So how can people get a hold of you? And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about um, what's, what the giveaway entails. Yeah. So if they want to email me, my email is brett, B-R-E-T-T, at lovefuckingsucks.com, all spelled out. Um, my Instagram handle is lovefuckingsuck, all spelled out with three underscores at the end. Um, and yeah, you know, email and Instagram is probably best. Awesome. Very cool. I'm wearing one of the shirts now. Uh, oh, yeah. Where does this logo come from? I mean, the color, I, I don't know. Good thing I'm tan right now, but like, <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the, logo. about the branding and the logo. Yeah. Yeah. So that right there, you have some uh, psychedelic mushrooms on your left nipple. And, uh, it, you know, I, to me, love, there's something so psychedelic about love because it, it, it literally is mind altering, like only a psychedelic substance could be. And, you know, I'm a fan of psychedelic substances. I think they can be very therapeutic and there are many benefits to, to using those, those natural psychedelics. And yeah, you know, and right now I am releasing that sure part of it, but the honeymoon phase. And to me, you know, the honeymoon phase is like tripping on mushrooms. You're just every, you know, you could look at something and just be so excited about it. And literally everything that person does, you're obsessed with. I always talk about like the scene in 500 Days of Summer after Joseph Gordon-Levitt has sex with Zoe Deschanel for the first time. And he's just like hopping through the park, you know, Hall and Oates is playing. Like that, <laughs> that is the honeymoon phase to me. It's the best feeling in the world. Like, like only a, a mind altering substance could compare to that feeling that you get when you're ripped about someone and excited to see what comes next. And if it is, you know, if you guys are in it for the long haul. Oh man. So thanks that's where for the sharing. Come from. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. That's really cool. So stay tuned guys for the collaboration between love fucking sucks and the believe be real, be bold podcast, Instagram accounts and here on the podcast. So uh, if, if Brett's message resonates with you guys today, you know where to get a hold of him. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Brett. Thank you. It's been fun. Thank you. So fun hanging. My pleasure.